Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al anbiya wa sayyidi al mursaleen wa shafi al mudhnibin sayyidina wa nabiyyana abil qasim Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thumma salatu wa salamu ala ahli baytihi al tayyibin al tahirin al ma'asumin al madlumin al muntajibin. La siyama maulana wa sayyidi sahib al asri wa zaman ruhi. وأرواه العالمين له الفداء وعجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear brothers in Islam and sisters in Islam as we continue in this blessed month of Ramadan for 2021 we once again begin by thanking Allah for allowing us to reach to this blessed month of Ramadan, knowing the fact that many of our friends and family members may have left this world prior to this blessed month, and we ask Allah to shower His mercy upon those who have passed before us. We ask Allah to give us the tawfiq to make it through this blessed month of Ramadan, and we ask Allah to protect all of our community, our family, our friends, the mu'mineen around the world, and all of humanity who may be suffering in one form or another. As we know that the gates of the Rahmah, the mercy of Allah, are uh, wide open more so in Ramadan than any other time of the year, more so in the month of Ramadan than any other time of the year. And so we ask Allah to allow all of us to benefit from His never-ending expansive mercy. This evening we are going through session number four of our review of Surah at tahrim chapter 66 of the Noble Quran, the, known, the chapter known in English as the chapter of the prohibition. And you'll recall that we've been going through, we went through the analysis of the introduction, history of revelation. We got to a point where we're looking at the actual text of the verses of chapter 20, uh, chapter 66 rather. We continue on and just as a reminder of where we were the other day in the session, in session three, a recap. We had looked at the topic of the plans of Aisha bin to Abu Bakr and Hafsa bin to Umar against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as mentioned by Allah Azza wa Jal directly in the Quran and we quoted from non-Shia commentators of the Quran as well to show uh, their activities and why Allah had to reveal this chapter to the Muslim Ummah. Again, this is not only for the Prophet, this, this chapter, this is for the Muslims in, the, in, in, in Medina, keep in mind, who were reading these verses when they were coming down to the Prophet. And they obviously were recognizing the fact who these women were, who were doing this against the Prophet. And this is a chapter for us today, 14 centuries later, to recognize the role that Allah, uh, that Allah has shown to us of some of the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Today for uh, session four, our theme that I want to go into Obviously, the overall theme, as we have been mentioning over these last nights, is the warning, uh, warning those who plot against the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, whoever you are, whether you're a wife, whether you're a companion, whether you're a, a, a foreigner, a non-believer, Allah warning those people who plot against the Prophet, including his wives in Medina, of what their outcome will be. Our first topic, as we have been saying, which covers us from verse 1 until 5, is Allah's support for the Prophet وسلم, against his wives if they plot and plan against him and who of those are have done that. And the direct theme for this session today is the supporting of the Prophet وسلم, through Allah وجل, and the armies of Allah. Yes, today will be a continuation of the previous topic, my brothers and sisters, and it's an important topic. Not because I'm saying so, but because of the fact that Allah revealed this in the Qur'an. And Allah only reveals that which is relevant, pertinent to the Muslim ummah, to the community at large. If this was a, um, a topic which was unimportant, irrelevant, it would not have made the Qur'an. And it also shows that this is timeless. It is not only for 14 centuries ago in Medina, it is as relevant today in how we understand the term Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the, 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 the mothers of the believers, how we understand the wives of the Prophet vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to him, and how we are instructed to interact with these 
uh, people who are blessed, really, to have been married to the greatest man to ever walk on this earth. We move forward, and I just remind us again of the people involved in the conspiracy against the Prophet, because again, Allah is continuously mentioning this. Although, again, as I said, that Allah does not mention the names of Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, or Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, but commentators of the Quran, the Shia and the Sunni, the Hadith from the Shia and the Sunni, are all clearly pointing to the fact that these two are the women who were plotting in the conspiracy to insult, to mock, to defame, to humiliate not only their husband, but the messenger of God, the final messenger of Allah, Khatimun Nabi'een, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So let us move forward tonight and look at verse number four in detail. In the Arabic, Allah says, after Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajim, In tatuba ilallahi fakad sagat kulubukuma, wen tadahara alayhi, fa inna allaha huwa maulahu, wa jibrilu, wa salihu al mu'minin, wal malaika tu ba'da dhalika zahir. This verse, my brothers and sisters, is one which demands us to really think very hard on the Qur'an and remove any biases we may have to personalities in Islamic history and to recognize the fact that being related to a messenger of God, whether you're a spouse or a child, it makes no difference. We have to be aware of that. We have to look at the Qur'an from an impartial, unbiased perspective, remove our glasses if we are wearing the glasses of Shiaism or Sunniism or Sufism or Wahhabism or whatever ism of Islam we claim to follow. We need to remove those notions, those preconceived notions and biases and look at the Qur'an as the Qur'an stands. Not to justify and vindicate people who do not deserve that. Let us read what the Qur'an says. Let the Qur'an speak. Don't speak over top of the Qur'an. So what does Allah say? He says, In tatuba. If the two of you, this tawba and the, the way that the verb is constructed, it refers to two people. If you two, meaning the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, although not named, but the commentators are unanimous, that the namely it refers to Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, and Umar, and Hafsa rather, the daughter of Umar. If the two of you turn to God in repentance, in tawbah, keeping in mind the text in brackets and parentheses is an explanation of the verse, then Allah says, then that is indeed what you must do. You need to do tawbah because you have done a major sin. Then Allah says what? If you do that, if you turn towards God because you need to, because of your sin, because the hearts of both of you swerved from what is right. Look at what Allah says. فَقَدْ سَغَتْ قُلُوبُكُمَا your two, Both of you, your hearts have swerved from the haq, from the true path. You have diverted from siratul mustaqim to the path of deviation, of uh, misguidance. So Allah says, if you want to come back to the path, you need to make tawbah. You need to ask God for forgiveness because your hearts have swerved from the truth. But Allah says, but if you too, meaning the two wives of the Prophet, again, Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, and, and Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, if the two of you back each other up against him, against the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, then look at what Allah is saying. For inna laha huwa maulahu, then be mindful that God himself is the maula, is the guardian of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Not only is Allah the maula of Rasulullah, Jibra'il alayhi salam, the archangel, the perfect angel of God, the one who gives Rasulullah revelation, he is the Mawla, he is the guardian, the protector of Rasulullah. And not only angel, not only Allah and the angel Jibra'il, Allah says, was salihul mu'mineen, the righteous, one, um, righteous ones amongst the believers, which we will get to shortly. He is, this third individual is a Protector is the Mawla of Rasulullah. And the fourth is Wal-Mala'ikatu Zahir. Wal-Mala'ikatu Ba'da Dhalika Zahir, rather. 
and all of the angels are the helpers of the Messenger of Allah. Now think about this as I move on, and I want to put this thought in your heads tonight. That we know that Allah has always been there for His prophets. We know that Allah and the angels are always there to assist the messengers of God, especially the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. But I would challenge us to read the Qur'an and find a similar verse about the prophet engaging in war against the mushrikeen or the kuffar, and Allah saying that we will help you, I will help you, Jibra'il will help you, the Salihul Mu'mineen will help you, and all of my angels will come and help you in a battle. We know that the Prophet went through battles like Badr and Uhud and Khandak and Khaybar and Hunayn. All of these battles, and no doubt Allah sent reinforcements as He did in the Battle of Badr, as the Quran testifies. But what about other battles, Uhud and other ones? Did Allah expressly say in the Quran to you and I that Allah would be there to help the Prophet and be his Mawla and his protector? Or that Allah would send Jibra'il? Or the righteous believers? Or all of the angels and ranks? Allah, I don't think, does that in the Quran, my brothers and sisters. And if you can point a verse to me that says that verbatim, I would change my perception on that and my understanding. But this issue is so, so important to Allah. This issue of Aisha and Hafsa insulting the character and integrity of the greatest human being to walk the earth, Allah finds this so egregious and so insulting and humiliating to Rasulullah that he says that if you do not repent for your sin, and repentance means you ac accept you are wrong, you change your ways, Allah says he will, and if you back one another up to continue in this attack against the Messenger of God, Allah says, I'm not going to sit by idly and watch you attack and engage in character assassination. I will be there to stand up for my Prophet. Jibra'il will be there to stand up for Rasulullah. Salihul Mu'mineen, this individual, will be there to help Rasulullah. And all of my angels will be there at his service. That's something for you and I to think about, my brothers and sisters. Whatever denomination of Islam we follow, whatever understanding of Islam we have, think about the words in this verse. Let me move on. Because who is this? We know Allah. We know Jibra'il. We know the Malaika, the angels. Who is Salihul Mu'mineen? There are a lot of different opinions in the books of the Ahlul Sunnah. I'm giving you one example from a book called Shawahid Tanzil which is written Shawai the Tanzil li Kawaid at Tafdil, the full name, a two-volume book written by Al-Hakim Al-Haskani. He's a, a Sunni scholar who wrote a two-volume book on all of the ayat of the Quran in praise of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim wa salatu wa salam. It's in Arabic. There is a translation in English which has been done. Inshallah, it will be printed in a couple of years. He quotes pages upon pages of hadith, and he grades them. He said, this is Sahih, this is Mursal, this is this, this is that, using the great, the, using the science of anal analysis of the hadith. But he comes to the, I'll just quote you one hadith, um, volume 2, page 351, tradition 995, in which he quotes from Ibn Abbas, where, as is, you can see on the on, on, on screen, and as for the words of Allah, but if you two back each other up against him, when tadahara alayhi, he says, Ibn Abbas says, that this was revealed about Aisha and Hafsa. And as for the words of Allah, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرَيْلِ This was specifically revealed about the Messenger of Allah, that Allah is his Mawla, and so is Jibreel. And he says, as for وَسَالِهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The righteous ones, righteous ones amongst the believers, he says that this was revealed about Ali in specific. Alayhi salatu wassalam. There are other hadith that he quotes and other scholars have quoted saying that this verse was revealed about Abu Bakr and Umar and Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam that is. But we look at the consensus. What are the ulama saying? What are the majority of the hadith pointing to? What is the accepted opinion? 
What is the veracity of those hadith that claim that Abu Bakr and Umar are the ones to help the Prophet? Where did they help the Prophet in this? Did they defend the Messenger of Allah when their daughters were defaming and insulting the Prophet and calling him smelly and bad breath and spreading his secrets that he told them? What did they do to reprimand their daughters? Do we have proof in history about that? So this is one example of the greatness of Imam Ali salam in the Qur'an where people say, show me Ali in the Qur'an, where is the name Ali? Well, it's not there. But the qualities of the man are there and history testifies to the greatness of this man and nobody can deny it. Nobody can deny it just as nobody can deny that the two wives talked about in this verse are the daughters of the first and second Khalifa respectively. Now we see that this balance is there. Now, now think about this brothers and sisters. On one hand you have those plotting against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam namely Aisha and Hafsa. On the other side of the scale, those who are working on the side of the Prophet, you've got Allah, you've got Jibra'il, you've got the righteous believer, Imam Ali alayhi salam, and you've got all of the angels of Allah. When you have the scales tipped in that way, who do you think is on the right? Who do you think is honest and truthful and sincere? Who do you think is on the path? And who, is, who has left the path of, of, of true guidance? It's clear that when Allah is on your side, when Jibra'il is backing you up, when the righteous believers, and meaning Imam Ali alayhi salam, is there to support you and, 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 and ensure that your dignity, your honor is not tarnished in society, and every single angel of God is backing you up, you know who's on the right and who's on the wrong. There's no other way around it. Those on the side of the Prophet, my brothers and sisters, we have to acknowledge the fact that they are on the right path and those who are working against and plotting against Rasulullah, they have a lot of answering to do. And they can't speak today, but their record, their track record shows where they were at in the scale of things, in the grand scheme of things, where they were at with their husband and with their messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi let me move on with some lessons to learn from this verse. And again, it's, it's a very deep verse. It's very profound. It's very sad that Allah has to use such language against these individuals. But you know what, brothers and sisters, if you read the Quran from beginning to end, you'll notice that not all of the prophets had it easy with their wives. Some of them had very, very great difficulties that they, that they had to struggle with. And we'll see that at the end of this chapter as well, as I mentioned previously that this chapter is very unique in that way. So what are the lessons that we can take home today in this Ramadan as we review chapter 66, Surah Taharim? Because obviously these verses that I'm speaking to you about nightly that Allah gave us 14 centuries ago are not stuck in history. They're not, you know, for a museum to marvel, to look, to put them in a museum and look at them and marvel at them, to draw calligraphy of the verses and amaze ourselves at the beauty of the calligraphy. No, they are there for a purpose for you and I to learn from even today. Aside from the historical narrative and the perspective of history. So let me leave us with some of those lessons to learn. Lesson number one is that those who acknowledge that they have committed a sin in life can always return back to Allah Azza wa Jal through asking Him for forgiveness. And this is a point that I always want to stress upon to you, my brothers and sisters, that no matter how much you think you have broken the rules of God, no matter how many sins you may have committed, your prayers you may have missed, fasting you may have ignored, khums you haven't performed, hajj you haven't given, or khums you haven't given, hajj you have not performed, don't think that there is a dead end in Islam. La taqna tu min rahmatillah, as I've said umpteen times, that never despair of the mercy of God. Recognize that we have made sins, we have made blunders in our lives. Turn to God. And this, again, Ramadan, as I, I've said before, is the best time to turn to God. Not only on the Layali al-Qadr nights, on the 19th, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29 of Ramadan. Every night in Ramadan, my brothers and sisters, in the month of, month of Ramadan, take. 
10 minutes after the prayers, after your iftar, and just sit and think about the life that you've led up until this point. If you've led a pure life, alhamdulillah. But if you recognize that you've got some blemishes on your record, that you've done some things you're not fully proud of with Allah, then turn to Allah. Tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha with a sincere repentance, as we will look at later on in this chapter as well. It's never too late to turn back to God, brothers and sisters. It's never too late. Number two, point number two is that listening to gossip is as prohibited, as haram, as the one who is speaking and spreading words, and both need to repent. You know, sometimes we may get caught up in a gathering or we're on a WhatsApp chat with somebody and things are said about people of the community or our own family members maybe which are not becoming, which we should not be talking about. Gossiping, spreading rumors. Did you see her? She's doing this. She's with that. She's doing this. She's saying these things. Did you hear about that guy? He's doing this. He's doing that. Did you hear about those two people? They're like this. They're like that. These gossips, even things that are true, it doesn't mean because it's true that we're allowed to talk about it. Ghiba, backbiting, does not mean you're talking things are, that are not real. No, backbiting, which is a vast topic in and of itself, means that you are talking things about somebody else that they are acknowledged to be have done, but you're not allowed to talk about them. Yes, there are exceptions to the rule, and I don't want to get into those. You can, you know, find lectures online from respectable Shia scholars where they talk about riba and what are the limits of it, where, where is it allowed? Because there are times when you need to do riba. But there are times which are the majority of them. I mean, 99% of the time, you are not allowed. We are not allowed to talk about other people. So this he said, he said, she said, all these things that go on, it's haram. And it's haram to listen to that. So we have to be very careful, especially in Ramadan, we should be keeping away from this all year round, obviously, but especially these days and nights. Spend your time with the Qur'an. Heck, I would even say, if you're able to, just do away with social media for 30 days. A detox of social media could do the body good, and do the mind good, and do the spiritual heart some good. Right? Maybe you need social media because of the work you do, your job that you do. You might need it to post or keep in touch with family. I get that. And I probably am also um, going to use my social media for those needs and for other purposes. But frivolous, wasteful talk, argumentation, as sometimes happens on our WhatsApp groups where people are arguing about religious issues where we don't have the credentials to argue. Just leave it alone, brothers and sisters. Number three is that the aid of Allah Azawajal, comes in all forms, physical and metaphysical. Allah will help, the angels will help, and the true believers will help. You know, so we can plan and plot and work against even people of our community. But Allah, when He loves somebody, He will make sure that His assistance is there, the divine ghaybi help or even physical help of the believers will come to the aid of those people whom Allah really loves. We can try to insult people, reduce their name, uh, you know, tarnish their character in a, in a community or in a society or in a jamaat. But if Allah loves that person, He will ensure that that person's honor is maintained and their dignity is restored. What any kind of loss of uh, character that they have been... Uh, uh, that they have had to or, the ordeal or suffer, Allah will ensure that they are elevated. Allah is the mawla. Allah is the master, the believer, the protector of the mu'mineen. Point number four is that we need to acknowledge and give credit when credit is due. And mention those who are outstanding workers or volunteers. Look, in this verse, you and I saw how Allah singled out Jibra'il amongst the angels. He could have just said, if you attack the Prophet, I will get all my angels to support him. But Allah says, Allah huwa mawlahu wa Jibreel. Right? Allah says that Allah is the master and Jibreel and the angels. This shows you and I, brothers and sisters, at home, in our community life, in our jamaat life, in our work life, in our school life, if you're a teacher in madrasa or the public school or the Islamic school, 
you need to recognize those students, those employees, those volunteers in the Jamaat who are going above and beyond the call of duty. A, B, C, D. Above and beyond the call of duty. You have a volunteer in the Jamaat who is exceptional. Let the community know about them. You know, they might not like to be known and, and promoted, but this will encourage others to want to volunteer, perhaps. And at the end of the day, we all need to be recognized for the work that we do. You're at work and you have an employee, obviously, who's done excessively well. They obviously get rewards. They get perks at work. At school, children who do exceptionally well are recognized in the, in the, in the school. As a community of believers, we need to ensure we acknowledge and give credit where credit is due. And not artificially because he's my friend or he's a family member. And so I'll artificially pump up their egos because, you know, they're a yes man. They do what I want them to do. They sign on the bottom line whenever I ask them. They vote in my favor when I need a vote of whatever. No. When credit is due, you support, you acknowledge, you appreciate. These are teachings of Islam for management and guidance and administration, brothers and sisters. Point five is that asking repentance from Allah is not limited to just a verbal sentence. You know, people say, oh, I'm going to do istighfar, I'm going to take my tasbih. Astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. A hundred times I did in Ramadan, boom, I'm done. My istighfars are done. I have nothing else to worry about now. No, rather, istighfar involves a change of heart and a resolve not to go back to your old ways. You don't do backbiting riba of a believer. You grab your prayer beads, you do the istighfar on 19th of Ramadan a hundred times, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilay, astaghfirullah ha rabbi wa atubu ilay. And then the 20th of Ramadan, you go back to sinning, to backbiting. Then 21st comes, you grab the tasbih again, you do the hundred times, hundred times. No, this is preposterous. We are fooling ourselves, brothers and sisters, if that is what we think tawbah is. Tawbah is not just astaghfirullah, atubu ilallah, atubu ilallah. These are words, but the word is meant to impact the heart. And maybe that's why Allah said, or the Imam, rather why the Ahlul Bayt said in Ramadan, on these layali al-qadr, do the istighfar tasbih a hundred times. Why not just once? Maybe because after five or ten, becomes repetitive, becomes monotonous. Molana's just going on and on, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 times, 99. Finally, a hundred, he's done. No, maybe it's there because after a few, we might feel indifferent. Maybe at the 48th time, we might actually recognize in our heart, in our mind, what I've done wrong. And that 48th astaghfirullah that I've said was the one that changes my life. Maybe that's why that, that, that is there. That's, maybe that's the secret behind why we do dhikr 50 times, 33 times, 34 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Just putting it out there for you to think about. Point six is that as believers, we must do all that we can to ensure the honor and integrity of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is maintained in society. When those people drew the caricatures of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, did we protest and say that that is not our Prophet? He, he's not like that? When people make movies defaming Rasulullah, do we stand up and protest peacefully? with logic, with intelligence, with, with respect. Not that we run out chanting death to this and death to that and behead this and kill that. No, that's foolishness. But do we stand for the honor and integrity of Rasulullah? Look at what Allah did when Aisha and Hafsa are plotting against the Prophet. He stood up, Allah, metaphorically, obviously. Allah said, I will not take any insult to my beloved Habib. And I will make sure that I'm there to support him and that the angel Jibra'il is there and Imam Ali is there and all the angels are there to support Rasulullah. Allah says, I'm not going to tolerate any, any disrespect to my prophet by whoever it is. I don't care who it is. Point number seven I'll conclude is that when Allah considers a person to be righteous, he places them in the same ranks as the angels. Subhanallah. You know, angels and Imam Ali are inseparable, really. Day one, when Rasulullah gets revelation in the cave of Hira, 
Imam Ali is there. Imam Ali is told by the Prophet, you will hear what I hear, but you won't see what I see. Angels were there. Imam Ali was there. When Prophet receives revelation in the house with Khadija alayhi salam, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali is there. When the Prophet goes on Hijrah to Medina, who is sleeping in the bed of the Prophet? Imam Ali, what happens? Jibra'il and Mikail are ordered by Allah, you go down to earth and protect Ali. Jibra'il is at the head of the of Imam. Mikail is sitting at the feet, saying, Bakhin, Bakhin, ya ibn Abi Talib. Congratulations, O son of Abu Talib. Who can be like you that you are guarding the Prophet of Allah? Jibra'il and Mikail actually are quoted as saying that we are not willing to sacrifice our lives for one another. But yet you, Ali, you are willing to sacrifice your life for the Messenger of God. And here Allah is saying that I'm going to put Jibra'il at the same level as Imam Ali, as the angels of God. He's not God, of course. Nobody ever says that of the Mashiach and Ashari. We don't believe in ghulu and extremism. But Imam Ali is higher than most human beings, higher than the angels even, lower than Rasulullah. He's a man who we don't know, we don't, still don't know my, of my brothers and sisters. Let me conclude here because we've gone over our time for tonight. And God willing, we will conclude or we'll continue, actually not conclude, but we'll continue tomorrow evening as I continue my review of chapter 66, Surah Al-Tahrim, the chapter of the prohibition. Until then, may Allah protect each and every one of you. Have a blessed evening. And keep me in your prayers, please, as I remember each and every one of you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.